dynamics of string ecosystems using different uh, remote sensing uh, platforms. Uh, he is currently working on NASA's Global Ecosystem Dynamics Investigation Mission. Uh, he is uh, um, on the um, science stability team. And Dr. Tom Pink of NASA Earth and Space Science Fellowship as a new investigator award. Okay, give the board to you, Dr. Tang. Thank you for having me. Um, so give us kind of a really brief introduction here, like since like Jedi, like what do we call Jedi a lot of times, been mentioned several times. So this is actually where Jedi is going to be spotted on the International Space Station. So this is the International Space Station. Uh, the Japanese experimental module, the JME EF, and that's where we're going to have Jedi. I believe we're going to have the eco stress there pretty soon as well. So it's already there. Uh, the reason that's, that's the reason why we're not usually pointing to the continent US and pointing to Japan instead. Anyhow, uh, just a little bit of background story and the title of my talk today Mapping Global Canopy Cover and a Vertical Profile Matrix Use Space Mode Light. Data. So, to, like, I know like, a lot of people here doing LIDAR work. Kathleen, for example, John, he was saying like he was using a liner to see the thing at a most profile or aerosol or the other things. But you use liner to do the 3D vegetation structure as well. A little bit here. So why we liner to do the 3D vegetation structure and how we should measure the vegetation structure, create all these measurements. And of course, there'll be a bunch of applications of the 3D vegetation structure. And of course, I'm going to share in the part two of this talk that's about the latest development of JEDI, which is still launch within a month. So vegetation structure, what are we really talking about the, of vegetation structure? This is a retrospect of the past century development of climate models. Actually, you know, it's just animals fur and the ocean. And have land, their more realistic geography, changes of clouds, and it's not until in the 2000s that we have the concept of dynamics of vegetation. So what do we do there? One of this is the land cover or forest cover change, for example. This is from the, uh, Dr. Matt Hansen in our department as well, using landsat data to capturize the forest scan and loss at resolution. But this is one part of the story. Forest can be like cut so within in a, like path so, like if, for example, if somewhere in the Amazon, it's all gone. But it might also experience some kind of the degradation at final scale. Uh, that's more related to this concept here, the Pomer Montes Big Lift. So we can use this fine scale vegetation model to describe a bunch of the uh, physical and the physical um, processes. A process or to approximate this um, process within a concept of living there. Which describes one like a bunch of leaves or foliages within the uh, forest, notably so from the modus LAI product, and it keeps pretty much like over the entire Amazon, it's so called dense forest with a value of about six, if I could say so. So this is a question. So it's really a good idea how we capture the vegetation dynamics or structure. Probably not. Why? So let's go to the definition of forest structure. It's a really good description of forest structure, but not enough because the first two refers to both the horizontal and vertical distribution of the ecosystem elements and the action we usually would look like when you walk into a tropical rainforest. We have really tall imagery trees that can grow more than 50 meters. There, at about 30 meters, we have a nice thick blanket of canopy layers that can intercept 10% or more of the foliation. That's a Eurocrit limited reading conditions for this under canopy and the shrub layers. Sure, we have important functions, notably, I just mentioned light interception, and it in turn to help forests to grow. So that's all that's photosynthesis. And it's complicated. So in tropic forest, notably, forests can change over time. Now, the events of the evolution or like the disturbance cycles. So high edge trees that can grow usually pretty fast, like most of them are kind of the beta intolerant 
or like enjoy the sun most of the time. And as it develops, it creates an environment called like vertical diversification, diversity. So the environment allows some kind of small trees to, or shade tolerant trees to grow, to grow below the trees. And when it reaches maturation, it's all complex story here. As I say, it's complicated and changes over time. People might ask, why do we care? Why AI just kills all the things off? So here's the reason. Uh, all the important functions, I will just name two of them. The first one is biodiversity. So biodiversity matters. We lose it rapidly. Here's in the Amazon forest. All the red color indicates the presence of the endangered species. So it's pretty over this area. Which is usually across the roads or the disturbed forest. But check all these green areas, this green tag forest. Let's remain, there's endangered species there. It's just because we don't have enough knowledge about this forest. So what is to link certain metrics with the biodiversity formation in there. And it turned to be like the structure matters a lot. And here, for example, in the Habitabrook forest, um, it's come early on there. You see a nice black sort of wobbler thing at the branch, but it's actually where it's not, not there most of the time. In fact, these birds prefer have their nest at the understory layer. And here's the, the female and the little one. This echoes the classical study done by MacArthur in the 1970s, saying the, for the vertical stratification of forest matters in biodiversity studies. And a better quantification of vertical structure globally that can really help us target our conservation efforts and get losses in you know, rapid areas and focus our limited resources just over the harvest area. Number two, cycle. Well, well, I guess a lot of people here do deal with the carbon a lot. So we have a large uncertainty in our carbon budget, not only in the total stock, but also in flux. And we see here, as trees grow over time, you rate takes a lot of carbon sink in the early stages. And now we know not like about the stock in primary forests, and we even know whether they are carbon sink or carbon source because it's subject to climate change and other different factors. But this is for sure, like the major carbon sink. What uh, uh, to capture like how much carbon got absorbed by the forest is using, for example, the index and all the like light efficiency models. The problem here with all the AI, that is no in current observation we call the saturation effect. We know there's a linear relationship between the famous and AI. And AI, once when the AI goes about four or ish, and the, like what it seems more complicated is for the forest, say like, like you know young secondary forest or a little older secondary forest, the AI can get pretty high at the early stage, around like 10 to 15 years, it already reaches 80 percent of the maximum. <laughs> that really limits our current observation of the. Um, LEI has the, the capacity to absorb carbon. Uh, the and this forms my kind of uh, basis for why we need a, a vertical stratification of more accurate LAI. Measure the vertical structure and accurate are these measurements. This is the question here. Just using the LIDAR. LIDAR is short for light detection in the range engine. It's a remote sensing method to use the laser per to make distance to your target. In fact, it's not exactly the distance, it measures the timing, but we know the constant speed of light, so can easily get the, the, uh, the distance correct. Here's the nation made by NASA Gata, uh, but it's primarily for give an uh, introduction about the planetary uses of the laser, because in um, previous time, people mostly used the LIDAR to measure the DEM, for example, uh, even until the 1960s and the 70s, people realized the noises in the original LIDAR data turned out to be like, important information about the forest. And for that, 
boom, everything exploded, and it's a huge amount of applications of using LIDAR to measure the tree height, ground biomass, as well as leaf area index. Here's kind of a, a kind of classical example from Michael Lef Lefsky describing two types of LIDAR. We have this showing a, a waveform-like LIDAR, and also we have like this play, little plate here. Example, uh, another example from the discrete return LIDAR. I introduced like before using the spaceborne LIDAR, I would like to give a quick tour about the uh, more like better to use the LIDAR tools, notably terrestrial LIDAR and the airborne LIDAR. Terrestrial learning, uh, you will call it TOS. This is ground LIDAR basically, and you put it in the forest plot that it can, it can really create, recreate the forest structure in high detail. This is like examples in the Sierra Nevada National Forest. You can the leaves in green, the bark in the yellow, and the, all the pinks in, uh, of ground. And the image creates goes to Adam Strand and Chris Shove in Boston University. So this is the instrument called Echidna. But that was really like more than 10 years ago. In these days, like the TOS developed so fast that uh, there are a bunch of like powerhouses in the commercial market that kick in. Uh, notably, this data, for example, comes from the Rigo, Rigo VZ400 scan. In, in London, and some work done by Matt Disney to identify individual tree crimes here, Sigma and Ash. And a lot of like data now, so people actually want to decimate the data a little bit so it can be easily plugged into the models. Right now, really an active research field. This is the most widely used data, uh, especially in US, because we have a lot of the open data, uh, including by the NEO all the companies and the research groups here. Uh, I'll just um, like give a brief introduction about the uh, two uh, class examples of the LIDAR data I just mentioned, the discrete LIDAR data and the, dis uh, the discrete return LIDAR data. That's more widely used and also a full digitized the waveform. Uh, to describe the same thing, that is the interactions between the laser, uh, laser energy and all the uh, Elements it hit during the propagating process. So with, you can have a great, uh, like a brief idea how the uh, the like 3D structure elements distributed in space. For example, with full waveform lidar, we can have this kind of the famous form in our lidar acronym. So you can see a bunch <laughs> of like, like the uh, leaves within this waveform and have multiple paths and mosaic them together. You can recreate the 3D scene like this. And has the advantage over all the traditional passive optical remote sensors you've seen. Like notably uh, on the first row, uh, the uh, for cover percentage derived from uh, NASA, uh, from the GLCF, uh, at, also at Maryland, uh, Global Land Cover Facility. The Glass Manhattan's data set, an LCD data set, this represents like uh, Google Earth, uh, image clip here. You can see like LiDAR has the better visualization capacity with all of them, and uh, like no problems or all these kind of uncertainties related to the height distribution can be all resolved by LIDAR. And these are the two uh, aggregated results from the wave LIDAR and the discrete return LIDAR. So and like can deliver a better message about not only the height, but also the cover. And based on the cover, we come up with the idea of deriving the vertical AI profile. It's quite like in general, it just follows the Beer's law to give us the idea of how light attenuates within the forest canopy. Would it make light quite useful? It's because it's simple and quite accurate. It follows all the laws and how we like build our world, like how based on this foundation. And here's my favorite spot in the biological station, in Central America. Okay, uh, red dots uh, represent like each individual uh, measurements of this power. So what actually people do? Here? Just build the water and uh, the field of Columbus, collect all the leaves, and uh, make in a lab to give you the best representation of the water uh, forage distribution in the tropics. Light up. This is what it's like. Pretty good, huh? Like there's some saturation effect even when the OAI goes to 10 and it follows the pattern excellently, and there's no bias. We're using the power measurement against the, the LIDAR measurement. And uh, starting 
Scott Park, uh, another group from the Arizona, like pretty similar thing using the discrete return ladder, and it got results. So this really strengthens our confidence using the LIDAR to give you the most realistic track distribution. And now, uh, spacebound LIDAR. This are the examples from my set one. Actually, we have quite a high confidence in the airborne LIDAR data. We think we should apply to the spacebound LIDAR as well. So with the I set one, the uh, glass on boards on, on, on I set, and the waveform LIDAR at the uh, 10 6 nanometer, it has the vertical sampling uh, uh, um, with one second with a footprint size about 65 meter. So it sends um, like transects, so what you will see is like individual footprints along the, uh, along the orbit. So it's about one step along the track and really wide across track distance uh, like in the uh, equator. It's about many kilometers across. <laughs> when I put the uh, same algorithm to ISAT and uh, compare it with airborne LIDAR data, well, you would act somehow like uh, uh, accept, ex I would call acceptable or medium uh, agreement between these two because always some kind of issues with ISAT or with spaceborne LIDAR compared with uh, airborne measurement. But it really represents our best guess about the uh, actual forest structure we like. And uh, here, this, uh, like the overall accuracy for total AI is the best. And as it goes down to the honor story, the accuracy usually decreases because it's less a direct measurement. It's more like uh, based on the uh, estimation. Like a bunch of the vegetation variables based on the I set one data. Um, like height, for example, from uh, Michael Lepsky and Mark Simard at JPL. And so above ground biomass estimates, uh, notably Sasan Sachi and Alexander Bacini. Uh, interesting that the aerobic distribution. So what we see here is the image of the foliage by the interval of the Amazon forest. You will see, for example, um, of the, the peak of the foliage will be around 10 to 20 meters at the forest in, uh, deforestation archive in the, eastern, uh, in the southeastern of the Amazon. And uh, in the country, you will see like in the middle of the Amazon, most of the like foliage will be on like 30, 40 meters. And have a comparison with the MODIS data. You see a clearance here, right? There's pretty much no variation over this area, but we can see a clear contrasting pattern, even though their total value pretty much being equal. Now, with this new information about 3D, we're going to deal with this. So, this is something like be simply reviewed by a total AI. And what is that? Um, we've done a lot of tests, and here are just a bunch of examples. I imagine there will be more. But here are just examples to highlight why it's important to use this vertical information. This is uh, a more recent publication by the PhD in our group, Susanna Marcellus. What it shows is essentially taking the AI profile, like it's pretty much a standard integration. Mosaic them together, and she find a really nice pattern here. So a pattern that cannot be seen from the total AI or total canopy cover. Pretty much you see no patient. Oh, by the way, this is in the low pay. Uh, it's in the low pay of Gabon. That's a, a Central African uh, rainforest there. Here is like, like clear. You will see most of the um, foliage will be clumped over more than 30 meters in height. But here, in the island here, you will observe like most of foliage is being at about zero to ten meter in height. It's a really contrasting pattern that can easily show up here in different colors. And it turns out to be this here with most of foliage up in the canopy would be the prominent like a local forest, Ukume. And here is actually the color forest. So that's why it has most of foliage down in on the ground. And we can make a prediction based on this profile and tell us what's the distribution of the, uh, what's the vegetation classes based on the vertical information. And again, recall this previous talk, uh, LA cover, that's not giving you anything. This is another AI profile, some work done by Scott Stuck. And uh, you want to get the waveform and then know the LA distribution, we can recreate 
it's the size distribution using certain constraints because I have a pretty good idea what tree is supposed to look like, individual tree is supposed to look like, uh, like at different stages. Now you can unmix this to do like, like the distribution or pretty much succession stages of this particular forest. This is working done in the Amazon uh, two plots or in, in the Amazon. And I thought that um, there's a bit of work I've been doing um, that can help, like called by the uh, NS Decatur survey, saying, well, it helps resolve the long standing debates about the influence of droughts on tropical forest productivity and variability. Um, so it goes back to the original argument where the Amazon forests green during the dry season, like in kind of a couple of the communications on this topic. So, what I just like, I would love to see. What the, for, uh, the season means in the Amazon. See about that dry season. Most of the time, they spend the time talking about the June or July to uh, August in the central Amazon, which is just only a tiny part here. But in fact, Amazon is big, and the season there is really complicated. The dry season usually starts like pretty early in the southern part, like around March or April, and then the, the precipitation moves all the way. To the, uh, the dry season moves all the way to the north. So, what do you see here is like the uh, start of the dry season, uh, uh, yeah, like around um, ish, like at the southern part, and July or June in the center, and in the north part, it won't drop until the end of the year, so November or December. And it creates a unique environment conditions because the condition and uh, the amplitude of the, uh, of the droughts, in fact, is going to be. Different with the ice set observation. With that, I see you know what, like the canopy part pretty much was the track of the starting of the dry season. In other that when you have enough water in the soil at the start of the dry season and you have increased radiation, that prompts the growth of the leaves, and that's why you see all the green here. But when you're into the second part of the long dry season, probably six months longer in the southern Amazon. Trees don't stand that long, like it started to defoliate a little bit. It's, that's the uh, yellow part here. And then in the west season, there are more, more complicated patterns. And replicates as the rain season or the dry season shifts spatially. So, in a sense, that, that the entire uh, analysis in Amazon is complicated because it changes not only temporally, but also spatially. And you will see like the dry season appears <laughs> at different times. But the end of the story. So these have different layers. When canopy is starting, for example, here in the southern Amazon, starting the foliage during the peak of the dry season, it opens some gaps and allows more radiation to reach down to the subcanopy layer and a shrub layer. That gives you like extra radiation for all those kind of you know internal trees and the thick uh, seedlings there. And this uh, vegetation spend like all that in our life in shade and, and with the increase will prompt their growth. So that is the start of growth in during the of the dry season. Putting all this together can really help resolve our like like um, about the uh, productivity and variability in the dry uh, in, in the Amazon forest. Uh, kind of uh, all the applications I'm going to show, I'm uh, certainly imagine there are going to be a lot more than this. Um, that's we need Jedi because I said, as I mentioned, it's only really, really coarse resolution, like more than 20 kilometers uh, cross back at the equator. But Jedi is better, way better than that. <laughs> um, Jedi is the NASA Earth Venture Instrument, uh, and, like made back in 2014. Um, the ice, my PhD advisor, Rob Dubile, it was. Cost cap at 94 million, and it's going to be launched in a month. Hopefully, uh, we're going to see how SpaceX is going to do its job because the, the failure of the suits is definitely have some kind of impact on this. And this book of July, advanced our ability to characterize the effects of changing climate and land use on ecosystem structure dynamics. Pretty much, this too echoes my previous example. What here about the structure of the forest? Bunch of like key questions here. Want to ask what's the balance of the Earth's forest, like in terms of current stocks, like forest, death, and other dynamics related to the disturbance and the recovery, and we use models 
to see how many are going to be squeezed through forest in the future. And uh, we need the vertical information to help us quantify the relationship between the biodiversity and the forest structure as well. So I will probably make up to more than 10 billion shots of the forest and land areas and uh, to run for a nominal of two year operation. Um, and from Jedi is as simple as this, the waveform. It forms uh, is based on the waveform or geolocated waveform. So we know where we are. We have the, like, the waveforms on, each, um, uh, on all the land area. Um, the location area of the Jedi footprint is expected to be like around 8 to 10 meters, one sigma. It could be that after like, the post-processing uh, being applied. It delivers. Uh, the levels of Jedi are the level four product, which is the biomass uh, okay, at both footprint level as well as grade level. So the uh, other four uh, L4 products, like the, all the demonstrative products, including carbon change, land set, a base disturbance event, and other bunch of things, only be produced over selected areas, so not globally. All the data products about like the approximate resolution, so 20 time resolution of the geolocated waveform, and uh, that uh, includes all the metrics, including the height of the forest, uh, the elevation, and the kind of LAI, which are, are being respons responsible for delivery, and grades all the level two products, making a one kilometer grade globally, uh, finishing, like finished, uh, because this is a progressive uh, like uh, uh, process. We're not, uh, not going to release the, I think, the or which after six months or a year, because it needs to collect more data to fill the gaps. And the level bias uh, uh, footprint and grid products, and there are a bunch more resolution. So it's like the, a little bit of spatial specification with JEDI. So JEDI, again, it's a sampling waveform LIDAR. We mostly would see from the airborne LIDAR acquisition. So imagine this one kilometer box. LIDAR will fill all the boxes in a warm man, uh, manner, and for just, it's going to be only a bunch of the tracks, and also these are the field plots, and we also have the terrestrial light collections over certain areas. So together, they form, give us a really good representation of the forest structure. And again, this is the, what is the Jedi going to measure? So you have this attenuation of the uh, uh, radiation through the forest, and here we have the return, and it's on all the GPS information, we can characterize where footprints are and how accurate uh, uh, this data is. Uh, this is track from the International Space Station. There will be gonna, a bunch more of them. Uh, sorry, like I couldn't make the better. Uh, but all the graphs are actually covered by the orbits. And that's only one example. And for example, we can hit, we can select to choose to target some of the large areas because just the pointing capacity of like about two meters, we're still uh, in kind of a final plan for how best leverage the point uh, off point capacity in the area of the uh, observation, uh, the ground observations and uh, configure uh, spatial configurations of jet track. So a lot track you will have about 60 meters in distance, and a cross track like the each of them is going to be like around 60 meter, uh, 600 meter. So in cost, like in a curve base, it's about four kilometers worth. <coughs> so like the requirements of Jedi, like we have a baseline requirements that's eighty percent of the one kilometer forest set. We have a biomass accuracy of twenty percent standard error, or like less than twenty megaton per hectare, and acquire transacts of canopy profiles in conditions of up to ninety-five and ninety-eight can be covered. And have a threshold requirement which generates lowers the baseline requirements a little bit, and we're also going to revalidate and push all the through the next deck. Uh, level one, and level two are going to be in the Oak Ridge, and uh, level three and level four, uh, uh, four are going to be on the LP deck. Uh, I can verify this later, but it's just a general idea. Uh, I'd like to focus a little bit more on the canopy covering the AI profile since I'm responsible for dealing with that. Uh, we have done our pre-launch testing in Africa. The, um, that's where, like 
the previous exam come from. So NASA being flew up from uh, not only the Elvis, the uh, airborne LIDAR protocol, and uh, other like the SAR data over the uh, Gabon in Central Africa. So you can see the pretty good coverage over this country. What you see down here is a nice gradient between the savannas and the, the uh, created during the last age, uh, ice age, and the, the dense forest down in the south there. These are some results. We have both Elvis data as well as terrestrial scan, uh, uh, terrestrial scans, and black dots here represents the scan points, and the red circles represents the Elvis footprint size. So we get a really nice relationship uh, between these two. So pretty much no scattering at all, and you can see this stays almost the same through different intervals. Calculate the algorithm related. Uncertainty. Uh, not finally, as we go to final vertical resolution, you expect somehow larger uncertainty. But at uh, saying a vertical uh, resolution 50 meter, uh, about 5 meter or 10 meter, most of the uh, algorithm uncertainty will be gone. So, pretty much call our validation results saying, you know, there's a slight trade off between the accuracy and the vertical resolution. So, uh, I think for the, from the user's perspective, I would recommend a 5 meter. Uh, resolution using uh, for biomass calibration strategy. I will quickly go over this. Right now, we don't have any kind of real JEDI data. The way we're doing trying to build the JEDI uh, biomass model is through simulated JEDI data. So, it collect as many as field data and uh, corresponding lot data, simulated JEDI waveforms, extract the certain corresponding uh, JEDI metrics, and build a model based on the Simultaneous acquisition of LIDAR data and a field data. And we already get our model set up. So once we get the real JEDI data, we just apply the model and it gets the estimate and answer to that. And this is now, so we have a, a JEDI forest structure database. Oops. Uh, already collected more than 4,000 plus global wise. And it certainly gives us a pretty good representation of global forests and still in progress, and expecting more help from the community. Now, like, pretty much going to a new era of the uh, ecosystem observation, because we know there are going to be a bunch of them on the International Space Station as well. So I just mentioned, like, the ecosystem, and we're also going to expect the OCO3 and uh, high CO, like the hyperspectral one. So together, they give us a better representation of the terrestrial biosphere models, because we can have not as structure, but also like that's the physical part, and also like the biochemical part, and it can really help the model cast in the future. And it's only going to happen like pretty soon in the next few years. So it's really exciting. And one of the uh, from one of the recent papers published on the Nature Ecology and Evolution, so it can highlight like all the instruments and centered on the carbon sink potential and disturbance in ecology. And this unique from uh, just as the height, volume, and the variable <coughs> index. So I'm going to be done here. So I'd be more than happy to take a bunch of questions. And uh, the forest be with you. That's our Jedi demo. Go. But this is not going to be the focus of JEDI. Um, Brian Bolano said that he will keep some part of that for analysis. Um, but again, it's going to be really coarse resolution um, for JEDI. We have limited the capacity on ISS. So uh, the short answer is, is it has potential, but not, the, but not quite. be based on the existing data, uh, data set saying the SRTM data to see where the uh, cloud trigger is. So it's pretty much that one. one. Uh, basically, you have LIDAR, you know, that would so, uh, retain with any signal in its pathway. Right. I mean, cloud, aerosol, etc. Yes. They, they are 
themselves very valuable information. Yeah. Or any any uh, plan to generate the product uh, of a cloud or aerosol? Uh, to my best of my knowledge, we are not going to generate any. Um, yeah, we generate any of the data. Particularly useful for aerosol because yes, aerosol sir. is near surface, and you are intentionally to get the vegetation. That means that the signal must be very strong, reach to that right. and open like clip so designed for aerosol, but nevertheless, it's a once to near the surface boundary layer, the signal is really weak. So, right. so in that regard, it should be equally valuable for aerosol. Yeah, I know that um, all of that is definitely going to be kept a record in the level one, and, and uh, probably like this part is going to go to the, uh, level zero. It will be stored somewhere on the deck, but like probably it will be like, I don't know, independent solicitation for, for like on the Jedi. For us, we are only interested in the forest part, and it gets for the level 1A product. I think it's about like only 100 or 200 meter sacks over the, uh, uh, like in the sacks over the gray area. Right. But really, like this data is going to be, like the information is definitely there. But it's definitely not ideal. Like the same as I said one, it's not going to be like the, the as I said one, into that part. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Uh, question. I um, mean, like, but now, like, we assume similar procedure following, like, the Elvis process. Jia Hopton, a primary responsible for this, and we've done a bunch of work doing, uh, dealing with kind of the same data set. It turned out to work, like, pretty well. Um, but I wouldn't say 100 times, but 95% of times, it's going to be a pretty good result. Uh, and compare, compare with ISAT 1. ISAT 1 is notably, like, Difficulty extracting ground because it has a, such large footprint, and you won't expect a perfect match like over 65 meters. But for other uh, it's going to be like 20 to 25 meters, so it has a less pronounced effect over a small, relatively smaller uh, footprint. And you know, we you can't really tell until the data uh, until the data comes back to you. So Jedi's primary uh, data product is uh, biomass, right, as you said. Yes. Are there any ancillary products? Can other people can benefit from looking information to get at something like, I'm thinking about climate feedback. Mm -hmm. Things like uh, heat flux and albedo roughness and things sure. like that. Is it, are there work within this project to be able to, to use that information to, to get at? get a better estimate on the climate feedback problem. Yeah. I guess this goes beyond to the next solicitation or the, like, whatever from NASA, from NOAA, because Jay, is, as I showed, like, we are kind of the limited to budget. It's only 94 minutes. It's really small for a space mission. So what I mean is, technology, technologically, is it possible? I mean, is it sure. that you could actually use that information or obviously a lot of things involved in order to get, get at that? that with some constraint. Yeah. Absolutely. That's why I bring up like the whole uh, area and a profile like here. I would believe I will pro produce sort of the best uh, 3D structure globally and one kilometer resolution. Right. Yeah. So that's going to be super helpful for all models. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or um, it would be great if you come up with other ideas. Say, well, there's some bunch of other biophysical variables that's going to be input into your model. Um, to me, the obvious one would be the canopy cover, the AI, and the height, and biomass as well. So. Uh, very good, the inter uh, intermediate uh, level uh, between this uh, space ball and, uh, and the air ball. And uh, I, uh, my, my question is, uh, how long is uh, the revisit time? Uh, I mean, just uh, the access, so how long it can cover the whole, uh, whole area? You Plotted. It's like a lot of hard. Like first of all, back to your first question, the revisiting time, and it does not really have the revisiting capability. Uh, current designs we sell as, as many different places as possible. So revisiting is possible, but it's definitely not our priority. We want to have a, like so always a trade-off between the temporal resolution and the spatial resolution somehow. For the second approach, um, I believe, um, could you see the question again? Like, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the 
I would like so uh, um, it's hard to tell right now because all the content and errors are gonna have the effect there. Pretty much we won't use any of this, this like contaminated data like in our first observation. So uh, probably be better that you wait for at least an year. Uh, currents let the Jedi run in a systematic sampling for like six months to see what it look really looks like first. Analysis, but just like I can tell you in a deterministic way, but it's not going to be ac that accurate to fill all the gaps. It's better to wait at least a year to see. It's quite different. It's quite from satellite, sure. And it also depends what kind of evolution you would accept. Say, to achieve our ultimate goal at one kilometer resolution, we need two years. But we are okay with, say, 10 kilometer resolution in some because some of the models I'd be happy with. Like have to go 50 kilometers, you can use that requirement in like you know six months. So, <laughs> accuracy on the elevation. Elevation. Um, uh, they can't really like replicate what Skalowski gonna say, but. Um, uh, This one here for the level two. That's the AI kind of a, uh, my like the goal of deliver, delivering the AI profile at five meter vertical resolution. This is a profile. And it's a trade-off between the accuracy and the resolution. Uh -huh. right. How accurate can you measure the top of the trees? Accurate. Respect to some data. Yeah. What accuracy? Centimeters? Meters? It's about two meters. The height of the tree, yes. Mm -hmm. I think it's very impressive. Thanks. Yeah.